And so we've looked at Abraham a couple of weeks ago. We looked at Isaac a couple of weeks ago. And last week we looked at Jacob. And today we're going to be looking at the 12 kids of Jacob. Jacob has, well, actually has 13 kids, uh, but 12 of them become the 12 tribes of Israel. And you thought covering 25 chapters last week was a big deal. We're going to be covering like 25 books of the Bible today. Uh, it's going to be a kind of a, a, a real zoomed out look at who are the people of God, where God has placed them, about the purposes he has placed in front of them. So the people of God, in the place of God, about the purpose of God, that's what we're looking at today. Because when God comes to Abraham, Abraham wasn't looking for God. Didn't say Abraham went on a quest, on a spiritual quest to try to find the truth, to try to find God. God comes to Abraham and says, I pick you. You're my guy. He makes a covenant with Abraham. We saw this a couple of weeks ago. He says, you will be the father of nations. Look at the stars. Look at the grains of sand on the sea. Look at the dust of the earth. That is, that's what your descendants are going to look like. I'm going to build you into a nation. And the whole world will be blessed through you. Wonderful promise. He only has one kid, right? So that's not a lot of, you know, that's not a lot of nation. His kid has two kids. So we're on the right trajectory. Uh, Jacob and Esau from Isaac, and uh, we're on the way. But then finally, uh, Jacob, he now has 12 sons, and we see the beginnings, like the, the start of this nation promised to Abraham. So who, if we've got to look at who are God's people in God's place about God's purposes, you've got to look at who, who are these people? Who are God's people? Uh, the there's, there's a, a few names for the people of God. Uh, they, if you go back a, a bunch of generations before Abraham was Noah, who was alive in the time of Abraham, or when Abraham was born, uh, Noah's still around. Uh, Noah's son Shem uh, gave birth, uh, or his wife and wives gave birth to many people. And his descendants were known as the Shemites. And that's where we still today call those people that people group, the Semites, the Semitic people, come from Shem. And then a couple of generations later, uh, there was a guy called Eber, and his kids were called the Eberus, which is where we get the Hebrews from. And then a couple of generations later, we meet Jacob, who wrestles with God, and God says, you're not going to be called deceiver anymore. Rather, I'm going to call you Israel. And so this people of of God are known as the Hebrews, they're known as the Semites, they're known as the Israelites because of this lineage of grace that ultimately, the ultimate and spoiler alert, uh, way that God is going to fulfill his promise, his covenant to Abraham, that the whole earth that we bless through him would be the king who was to come. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. The, the, the 12 tribes, it's not just a, like a biblical footnote, it's not just, well that's that's nice. That's cool. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're the, they're the big deal. And, and although they have, I mean, they're the ones that do get mentioned many times, but it's the 12 tribes that we start to see, actually, the promises of God coming to fruition. And so as we'll see today, when we're looking at the 12 tribes, God's people it is the nation of Israel in this time. God's place is the promised land. And his purposes are that these people would reflect his character to the world and through them, all nations would be blessed. That one day, even we know from the benefit of hindsight, that God himself would come and live among his people. So let's have a look. Genesis 35 says, Jacob had 12 sons. Did you know, we saw this last week, Jacob's family was pretty messy. He had two wives. His two wives had two maidservants who also slept with their husband. So four mothers of his children, very messy family. So when, when we say uh, Abraham wasn't looking for God and Isaac wasn't really looking for God and Jacob wasn't really looking for God, uh, but God was looking for them. And God had made his covenant saying, you are going to be my people. 
Uh, we'll meet Moses today. And you see, Moses wasn't looking for God either. He was actually running away. But God came to him because he had made this promise to Abraham. And the 12 tribes, as hard as they might, will see them rebel and run away from the purpose of God and then even the place of God and certainly the purposes of God and God himself. But God is true to his covenant. So Jacob had 12 sons, Genesis 35. Leah's sons were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishkar, and Zebulun. Rachel's sons were Joseph and Benjamin. The, the sons of Rachel's slave Bilhah were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's slave Zilpah were Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob. So it's 12 sons, one daughter. And now, again, now we start to see the people of God. Uh, in, in the day, the birth order was a really important thing. We saw this last week with Jacob and Esau. Esau, the eldest, gives up his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Jacob deceives his father into getting the blessing of the firstborn as well. And you may, as I'm reading out those names, you may say, well, I, I know that I've heard about the line of Judah who was to come. Judah was the fourth born. How does this, how does this happen? Twelve sons, fourth born becomes the, the one through whom the Messiah, King David would be born and then ultimately the Messiah would be born. Why not the firstborn? Uh, good question. Firstborn ends up sleeping with one of those, one of his stepbrother's mums. So he was counted out. Then the next two in line, Simeon and Levi, uh, they end up lying to a whole group of people and then slaughtering a bunch of guys. And so they were counted out. And then Judah was the fourth born and, and, and so the three ahead of him were kind of counted out. And so when it came time, Jackie comes to bless his children. He says, actually, Judah is the one. Judah is the one through whom the line of kings will come. And indeed, from Judah would come King David and then the king of kings even, Jesus. Jacob says to Judah, prophesies to him uh, in Genesis 49. He says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's star from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And in fact, if you know the, if you've ever seen a map of the 12 tribes of Israel, you'll see Simeon, there is no Levi on the map. Levi doesn't actually get a, a kind of block of land, gets some cities uh, throughout the nation. And then even Simeon doesn't really get a prominent land. His is within the land of Judah and, uh, and kind of gets absorbed into Judah. And so it's not like these two people groups disappear, uh, but you see uh, how even their, their kind of fathers, the acts of their fathers ends up affecting the tribes. So these tribes are not just passive witnesses to God at work. It's not like they're just on the grandstand seeing God do his do his thing, these 12 tribes are used by God to bring about his purposes. Again, God's people in God's place about God's purposes. However, if you've read the Bible, you know the story of Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, the favorite son, given a cloak, a very special coat. His brothers hated him. He had dreams where his brothers and his mom and his dad were bowing down to him. Brothers hated him, ended up selling him into slavery. He goes into Egypt. Uh, you might know the story. Many chapters of the Bible cover it. God saves his people. What, what his brothers intended for evil, Joseph says. God means for good. And in fact, God saves his people and many others because of this one wicked act of his brothers where they don't kill Joseph, but they sell him into slavery ends up spending 12 years in an Egyptian prison and then ends up being like the second in charge over the whole region. And so his brothers do indeed come and bow down to him, which is again why if you've seen a map of uh, the tribes of Israel, you won't see Joseph anywhere. But in fact, Joseph gets a double portion, a double inheritance. Both of his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, become their own tribes equal to the other tribes. Uh, as Levi's kind of, he's out of it and Simeon's kind of absorbed and then these two tribes come in and, and are quite prominent. 430 years, the people of God are in Egypt. 
430 years, not in the promised land, not in the place that God said, I'll give you this land, but 430 years out of it, end up in slavery. If you've seen the Prince of Egypt, there can be miracles. And indeed, God delivers his people through Moses. Moses wasn't looking for God. God was looking for Moses. Met Moses in a burning bush. Calls him to be about his purpose. And through this time, we see the people of God radically, miraculously, wondrously delivered out of slavery and out of Egypt. And after spending 40 years wandering in the desert for about an eight-day journey, we see them in the promised land. The time of the judges, we see Joseph, um, uh, Joshua taking over from Moses, uh, from a different chi- tribe, from the Benjaminite tribe, uh, and Moses from the Levite tribe, his brother Aaron. They kind of become the, uh, the first kinds of priests. And uh, we see the people of God coming into the promised land, but there were giants in the promised land. There were people already there, uh, wondrous people. Um, they send out 12 spies who come back and give their report saying this land is amazing, flowing with milk and honey. This truly is the land that God, that Yahweh has promised us. We are God's people about God's purpose and this is the place that God had promised us. But they weren't excited about it because they saw the giants who were there. These people who were the enemies of God, preventing actually the purpose of God, preventing the people of God from being in the place of God. But there were two who gave the report. Actually, no. We don't trust in our own strength. We trust in Yahweh's strength. He has promised us this land. And man, one of the most striking things, maybe in all of Scripture, one of, it's up there, it's not the most, but one of, maybe in the Old Testament, is where it talks about the people of God going in to take the land and Yahweh himself going before them. Absolutely phenomenal. God himself going before his people. He directed them through the wilderness with cloud and with fire, provided for them with bread and with meat. And they already, after not very long of being out of slavery, were already starting to complain, already starting to rebel. God gives them his law. And even on the way down the mountain, Moses already sees him starting to turn away from God. And this is a pattern that continues into the period of Judges. They take the land. Again, God wonderfully fulfilling his promise. God's people now in God's place about God's purpose to to witness to him, to be a city on a hill, to be a banner waving, saying, Yahweh is amazing. Look at us and you'll see the character and the wonder and the amazing nature of the God who made you. That they'd be this light, this beacon to the nations. And that one day through their nation, all nations would be blessed when Messiah came. There's a long road ahead. In the time of the judges, the refrain, the constant refrain, the people did, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It doesn't mean everyone did the worst possible thing they could possibly do. But some people were doing good things. Some people were doing bad things. People were not seeking Yahweh. It even said after, after Joshua, the generations came that didn't know him, didn't know his law, didn't know his purpose. But God raises up judges. Men like Gideon, by, by whom and, and with whom he delivers his people. There's 300 people against the whole army. Judges like Deborah, who again, he delivers his people. Uh, and the tribes still doing what was right in their own eyes. No real unity together, just kind of floundering around. And they see the nations around them that have kings. And these nations that have kings seem to do well. And so they say to God, we don't want you to be our king, God. Please give us our own king. And God's saying, oh, I'm your king. I'm the one that goes before you in battle. I'm the one that delivers you with my righteous, strong right arm. And they said, no, give us a king. And so God gives them a king. Their first king, King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, 
Uh, he was a tall man. He was an impressive looking man, but man, he was a coward. He, he sought God when it was helpful and when he had a better idea, he'd do his own thing. Ultimately, he, he brings some of the tribes together, but it isn't until the next king, King David, his son's best mate, a great warrior, a great poet, and it, it turns out being a, a really good leader in many senses. A man after God's own heart, the scripture says of him. He comes to the throne and the people of God in the place of God about the purposes of God are united, really, for the very first time. It's the nation of Israel. It's the king. It's the kingdom under God, under King David. David's reign unites the tribes and under his son, there's this period of peace and prosperity and they, they had been worshipping God in a tent, essentially. And David and his son go, man, we can't keep worshipping Yahweh in a tent. We've got to build him a place. And God says, well, because you're a man of war, it won't be through you, David, but your son, Solomon. And so he builds the temple. And it's known as, this period of time is known as first, the first temple era, first temple Judaism. Perhaps you've heard it. And it's, and it's kind of wonderful. All the way along, we see these, the people of God who are being used by God, who on the one hand, you might, we can look at them from a Sunday school perspective and say, wow, what wonderful men and women. How amazing are these people? But you look at actually what the Bible says about them and what you see over and over and over again is people who aren't looking for God, but God is fulfilling, he's a faithful, he's the faithful God, fulfilling his covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Constantly, with people who are always, not always, mostly running away from him, mostly doing what's wrong. And even someone like King David ends up seeing somebody else's wife and saying, I want her. Has his husband killed? Takes the wife. Solomon who God asks, what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. He says, I want wisdom. The wisest human who's ever lived does incredibly unwise things, starts worshipping other gods. He's, he's the one who says, well, we must build a house for our, for our God, something worthy of him, and builds this wonderful thing. People come from other places and go, wow, your God must be amazing. Again, they're starting to fulfill their purpose, and yet... Not many generations later, the house is in shambles. Ends up being a split. The northern ten tribes split away from the southern ten tribes. There's no more unity. Rival king comes in from Assyria and routs the northern tribes. And then they became known as the lost tribes. They got assimilated and disintegrated. And where, where are the tribes? The southern tribes, the kingdom of Judah, as it's now known, Jerusalem's still there, um, you know, Benjaminites and um, the, the Judahites are still there and they're also completely taken over. King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians come in and rout them, take all the nobles away, teach them about the Persian ways, or the Babylonian ways, I should say. Persians come in, take those guys over. They're learning about the Persian ways. Eventually, after 70 years in exile, God's covenant with the tribe, with the tribes, does not finish. God sends them prophets from within the tribes to say, God is not finished with you yet. God's faithful. His promises endure. His faithfulness endures. So Jeremiah prophesies that this King Cyrus would allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem rebuild the temple, and you can read in Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, that's exactly what happens. And, and we see, again, God's people returning to God's place and getting back about God's purpose. The Levite tribe reinstate the Levitical priesthood, the worship of Yahweh. They find the scrolls and they read the law and they celebrate that Yahweh has again delivered us. This is now known as the second temple period. Lasts all the way through until even, even Jesus' time. Now we're in the second temple period. 
And the rebuilt temple symbolizes God's continued faithfulness to his covenant people. Even after all their sin, even after all their rebellion, even after chasing after other gods, if you read through that period immediately before they're in exile, uh, if you read through this or if you're doing the, the Bible in a Year program that, that we've been doing as a church, uh, I've been doing the listen to the Bible in a year and man, <laughs> going through the, the Kings and Chronicles and you hear, and then this person became king and he did what was right in the, in the sight of God. And you're like, yay. And then his son becomes king, king and he did what was wrong in the sight of God. And you're like, oh no. And then his son becomes king and he did what was right in the sight of God. And you're like, yay. And then his kid becomes king and he did what was wrong in the sight of God. And you're like, oh my goodness. God is so patient with his people. He is true to his word. He, he is the faithful one. His people are not faithful to him. He has to continually say, come back, come back. Over and over and over. And he sends prophets and they kill him. He sends prophets and they disregard them. False prophets come up and they're like, we like what you have to say. Keep, keep talking. And all the while God going, I, what, what more do I have to do? And there are these 10 tribes who have all but vanished. Who knows of them? Again, that they are the lost tribes. The second temple is back, but again, they are, they are a conquered people. And they remain a conquered people. And then other people come in and conquer them and other people come in and conquer them and eventually the Romans come in and conquer them. And then... God does something amazing because of his, his faithfulness. When his people were far from him, where they weren't looking for him, but he came for them. Judah's lineage uh, and the coming king. So we saw again back in Genesis 49, Judah is prophesied over him as Jacob is blessing him and his line. That the scepter would not depart from Judah until the rightful king came. Prophecy is fulfilled in King Jesus. It's not like God is done with the tribes. It's not like God said, he, you know, here's the tribes. Uh, from these 12 men will come the nations and through the nations, uh, through this nation, all nations will be blessed. And here's Jesus and now, whoosh, see you later tribes. We've got the, got the one guy. Rather, God's promise continuing to his people is now a promise opened up to all of the nations. Where this wonderful, Paul writes about it, he says, the Gentiles have been grafted in to the people of God. It's not like God said, well, Jesus is here now and now we're done. Goodbye. Goodbye, tribes. Thank you for your service. Wasn't awesome. But we had some good times. Brother, brother he says, here is the coming fulfillment, the inauguration of the new kingdom, the one who, for whom the scepter will never depart, he's now here. It wasn't fulfilled in David. David was a sign, a type, a foreshadowing of the one who was to come, who would not just have a heart after God's own heart, but be God himself, come to dwell among his people. And so we see, um, Judah and Judah's line as a, as a promise of the king who would come. We see Levi and his tribe as a sign and a, and a foreshadowing of the priest who would, be, who would be to come. But the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is the great priest, the true high priest, not in the line of Levi, but in the lineage of Melchizedek, this mysterious kingly, priestly guy around the time of Abraham. He's a better king. He's a better priest. And though the northern tribes were scattered or lost to the Assyrian conquest, God's plan for Israel and the nations included restoring all of his people. So they were known as the lost tribes. And Jesus says, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. Not just the tribes, but all of the people and certainly those lost tribes. 
And that promise extends even to us. We are God's people. Like Abraham, not because we went on a spiritual quest to find him, not because we climbed some sort of moral ladder to try to climb over the the moral threshold and get into God's good graces, but because we balanced the karmic scales in our favour, but because God came for us when we weren't looking for him. Because he chose us, not because we're awesome. Again, not because we're super intelligent and we figured it out. Not because we discovered some cosmic loophole that twisted God's arm behind his back, or you have to save me now because I, I found it out, figured it out. Not because we have the secret knowledge, but because God came to us and revealed himself to us. And he gifted us, Ephesians 2, gifted us the faith with which to receive his grace. It's self a gift so that nobody can boast. <clears throat> so Abraham doesn't boast. Isaac doesn't boast. Jacob doesn't boast. Joseph boasts a little bit, but then he grows up. So that nobody can boast. We are God's people. It's, man, it's wonderful. I, I, it's, it's a wonder that God has identified with nations of people, and a nation to become nations, who then spread out and become lots of different people, who rebel against him all the time, who sometimes are, are living in his place, on his purpose, is doing really well. Sometimes are not in his place, not about his purpose, and yet his covenantal faithfulness endures throughout all of that. And his covenantal faithfulness endures for you, person of God. Called into the purposes of God. In the, in the place that God has, in which God has situated you which I believe for most of you is probably where he has you now. <clears throat> he, you were born into your family, specific family, by, in the providence of God. You have the kind of nature and disposition and strengths and personality and some of those things, like with Jacob, need to be refined. Some of them just need to be wholesale redeemed. God has placed you in a place, again, in your family, maybe geographically in Adelaide. Maybe you're like, man, who wants to stay in Adelaide? We've got to go somewhere more exciting or more better or whatever. But perhaps God has placed you here to be about his purposes. And even if your place is somewhere else, we want to heed the warning of the Israelites who even when they weren't in their place, they could still have been about the purpose of God rather than, grumbling and seeking other gods and other things and getting impatient and complaining about what God was giving them while they were waiting. Twelve tribes are so instructive to us. They're mentioned all the way at the end of the Bible. Even in Revelation 7, we see this. It describes the ceiling of the 144,000 people from the 12 tribes of Israel, symbolizing again the fullness of, of all of the people of God who have come in, those uh, descended from Abraham who are still in Abraham's line through faith and those who have been grafted in who are his seed through faith. It reminds us again that God does not abandon his promises even when we do, even when we fail, even when we neglect him, even when we're in exile. God's faithfulness is... Wonderful. And then at the very end, Revelation 21, John sees the vision of the new Jerusalem. He notes that the city has 12 gates and inscribed on the gates are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, powerful reminder for the, these tribes representing God's chosen people are integrally connected to the ultimate fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Tribes that seem lost to us from our perspective, not lost to him. And Jesus says, like, none of them, none of them will be lost. When Jesus is talking about uh, um, false teachers coming up, he'll say, even some false teachers will come in, even into the church, they will deceive even the elect if that were possible, saying, it's actually not possible for those whom God has chosen. He came to seek and save that which was lost, and he is faithful 
to do it. He has done it and he is doing it in us right now. And like the people of God, he is calling us, the people of God, the sons and daughters of God, to be in the place he has, in which he has situated us, wherever that is, and in that place to be about his purposes. And he is faithful even when we fail, even when we neglect. He gently and wonderfully, like a loving father that he is, calls us back into his purposes, calls us back into his place. So if you're feeling far from God today, God is even now inviting you back into fellowship with him. He's not abandoned you. Again, consider the woeful example of the people of God and the patient faithfulness of the love of God for his people. And we've been grafted in. You have a seal of the Holy Spirit in you, guaranteeing that you belong to God guaranteeing his faithfulness towards you, guaranteeing his love towards you. So come back to him. If, if you acknowledge, you, yeah, you, you, I'm a person of God and I, I love God, I'm in the place of God, but I don't feel like I'm really about the purposes of God, then again, let's look at the people of God in the Old Testament. The, the first, the people of God. See, when they're about God's purposes, the kind of life, that they live, the fruitfulness that they have, the way that they show the love of God, like a city set on a hill, like a lamp on a lamppost that gives light to all in the house. It's the same call that Jesus calls us into, that we would be the light of the world. A city set on a hill, a light on that lampstand to give light to all in the house. And so God, again, he's still calling you, drawing you into his purposes to live as he has made you, in the place he has placed you to be about his business in the world. Let's pray together. So, Father, I want to thank you for the knowledge of these 12 tribes, the people that you called your people. Thank you for those uh, people who have faithfully written down their story and translated their story and interpreted that story so we can know how you've been so faithful throughout the generations to your people. And even as we look into the future, Revelation 7, uh, there before me was a great multitude, no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so God, we thank you that we will be among those people singing with the tribes. Holy is the Lord. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Praise you, God, for your faithfulness to your people and to us, your people. Thank you for making us a people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, sons and daughters adopted into your family, Thank you for treating us according to your love and your mercy and Christ's righteousness, not according to our best day and certainly not according to our worst day. Because of your faithful love, we know you as our Father. We know you as our King, as our Saviour. And so we praise you. We acknowledge you over everything, over this church, over our families, over our lives, over our future. And we want to be your people in your place about your purposes until we are in the new Jerusalem with you, worshipping you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.